sorry for the short delay, but I've heard the decision was everything but easy. For the last time, I'm reaching out to you from the Hita Datathon. For us in Berlin here, time has flown by. Months of preparation all come down to this. On the other hand, you are probably in one of two stages. So you're either we're hoping for more time to work on your projects, or you are happy that you have a long weekend ahead. It's incredibly when we watched you working and collaborating during your last two days. Um, and it's even more incredible to have a look at what you, dear participants, achieved during that short period of time. So please give yourself a pat on the shoulder, high five virtually your team. Um, yeah, you finished, you did it. And basically that's what counts. So congratulations on that. Yeah, there's applause going on. <laughs> um, yeah, so even if you're not a winning team, which we'll announce in a minute, um, your work still got recognized. And if you, um, if you give us your e uh, email address and personal address, um, which you will can we will reach out to you via Slack now, you will get that one and a few more goodies sent to you at home. So thank you very much for participating. We had around uh, 150 registrations from which 50 to 60 people get actively involved in the hackathon, which is, by the way, a really good ratio for virtual events. We had 10 teams formed and, no, sorry, 12 teams formed and 10 of you actually submitted the video. So that's quite good, but only up to five can actually win. The time has now come to shortly announce the winners for the Datathon. Deciding, as you heard before, is not easy. That's why we're thrilled that we were able to bring even more expertise to the decision uh, process. So now I want to introduce you to the jury. I hope, um, yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, there's, can I need the next slide, the clicker ain't working, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, our first jury is Hannah Meyer. She's a professor at the University of Münster where she is um, doing remote sensing and spatial modeling at the Institute of Landscape Ecology. S Hannah, are you already with us? Yes, I'm here. Can Welcome. You hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, yeah. Could you please give Maybe. us a short statement? Yes, um, I can. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me as a judge to this, event, uh, to this event because I appreciate that a lot and I really enjoyed going through the contributions. Although I have to admit that I probably have to go through all of the contributions <laughs> again with much more time to understand the solutions in detail um, because, uh, yeah, I could not... Uh, uh, finish understanding all the solutions in detail, um, but I will do that after this event now. So um, I think when looking at the contributions in general, I was really impressed about the quality of the solutions that have been achieved, um, especially when we consider the short time that the participants had available for this challenge. So um, I think we have seen a number of very complex and ex exciting solutions where the methods that were used here are definitely right at the research front. And in this context, I'm convinced that some of the proposals presented here can be regarded as a step forward in using data science in the context of climate change research. And um, what I liked a lot as well is that many groups put a lot of focus on validation of their models, which I think is very important, especially when we deal with um, very complex models such as the, the, the deep learning approaches that some of the groups presented. Um, yeah, so overall, I've seen uh, great projects, and I'd like to say congratulations to all of the participants for these great contributions. Um, and yeah, congratulations regardless if your solution will be now the winning one or not, because it was in um, yeah, some parts really hard to decide. Yes. All right. Thank you very much for your statement, Hannah. We got another judge. Let's see if the clicker is working. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So our next judge is Marcel Dico. He's head of the Division for Digitalization and Environmental Protection at the Federal Environment Agency, the Umweltbundesamt. Uh, Marcel, are you with me? Yeah, yes, I can I see am. you, perfect. Could I please ask you for your statement? Yeah, thank you. Uh, also from my side, um, I'm very glad um, to being invited to this event. Uh, I learned a lot, I have to, to admit. Um, uh, to see uh, people really working on solutions. Uh, that's something that we also want to do in the future in our agency. Uh, so 
uh, please feel free um, to feel invited uh, to come to our agency uh, in the future and work on um, AI and machine learning tools. Um, I was deeply impressed uh, by the, by the um, enthusiasm and compassion that you showed uh, with your solutions. Uh, that is uh, really something that, that, that makes me happy uh, to see that young people uh, are not only knowledgeable, but also um, uh, really uh, convinced uh, and, and equipped with uh, good knowledge and um, uh, experience uh, to find uh, such solutions. Um, so um, I was also impressed about the ability to reflect um, on the problems uh, that you were given in the challenges. Um, so that is something I think that, that we need that uh, people not, are not only able to find solutions, but also to be able to understand the problem um, and to, to adapt their solutions to the problem. Um, I find it really helpful that uh, at least some of you uh, also um, reflected on the data quality, um, because that is something that we, uh, in, in the real world of um, environmental problems and solutions, um, always have. Um, so uh, it's, it's good um, to see you Don't think me. about um, the data in itself. Um, I was... Uh, Lastly, um, impressed about your knowledge about the different um, tools and methods when it comes to machine learning. Um, so um, I see that uh, you have a broad knowledge um, and that uh, you're able to fit um, your uh, gained knowledge um, to, the, um, to the solutions. Uh, so that was uh, really good to see. Um, so uh, please continue to help us um, uh, solving problems uh, that are in the area of um, sustainability. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be part of this. Um, and I hope um, that you'll also be happy with um, the choices that we made as a jury. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hannah and Marcel, for your expertise and your time. Now the moment has come where you all have been waiting for, the announcement of the winning teams. For that, I welcome back all the challenge providers or their replacements. Each of them is going to announce their winners one by one. I hope you're all connected. I heard we are voice only for now, but I'll give each of you your minute and or minutes to talk about, um, and we'll use the order where we actually announce the challenges on day one. So. First one is Leonard. Leonard, are you with me? Yes. Perfect. Then it's your time. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. First of all, of course, big thanks to all people that worked on my challenge or all people that contributed as a whole. Um, I was actually amazed um, on how much was going on right from the start, um, especially well, knowing the data a bit and also having had the experience of showing and explaining the data to people for working um, on it, I was actually impressed how fast people sort of understood the, the underlying problems and the underlying relations. I mean, you've got these boxes and sensors and locations and sensors drop out and stuff. So that was, that was impressive. Um, well, then that being said, um, I mean, I was involved in the first process, sort of in the first video call on on how, which directions to take. And it quickly turned out that, um, well, the, the data is not easy, that's for sure. Um, I mean, that's why I came here with it, <laughs> um, which turned out to be a good idea because there were so many good, I, yeah, good approaches, so many things. I mean, I was sort of stuck at a dead end, if you want, due to the problems that all, all our participants experienced as well missing data, sensors dropping out, um, noisy data, irregular time steps. So that's all, all things that are pretty tricky from, from a practitioner's perspective, let's put it that way. Um, and most of the groups that handed in a submission did actually find solutions to these problems. So that was pretty interesting and they came from all different directions. Um, so for me, um, I'm super happy I'll get in touch 
with all of you pretty much afterwards because there are some things that I've already been thinking about that have been used in the new Dayton, um, others that I didn't even know about. So there's yeah a lot um, a lot of potential to pursue your your approaches. All right, I'll stop talking about <laughs> um, about the irrelevant things. I'll get to work right away uh, and announce the winner of my challenge, which is the team by the name of Moisture Magic. Um, why did they win? <laughs> um, I mean, after all, as I said, there were several challenges that did. I mean, I, I gave sort of five criteria, four four criteria to my challenge. Um, of which the most important was that the method should be semi unsupervised and pretty much all of the challenges managed to fulfill that criteria. But the team of Moisture Magic were the ones that actually managed to pursue their approach, um, tackling several of the points that I, of the criteria that I, I mentioned on the way and actually did a, like walked away all the way to the end. Um, so that I was amazed on how much they actually managed. Um, as I said, they they managed to treat the data first and then actually develop approach an approach that works. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Still, I do want to mention another team um, that where that yeah got really far in my opinion uh, is the team called Leaky Forest. Um, they did manage to set up a pretty solid baseline. Um, which did not cover all of the points that I mentioned, but they had the good vision of using uh, Gaussian processes afterwards, and that's something that I would be really interested in talking about, collaborating about. So I do want to point out um, that they did a really great job as well. So, yeah, I guess that's, I mean, I won't go into the full details. I'll contact you guys afterwards. Thanks, thank you so much for your, yeah, for your efforts, for your ideas. Um, I learned a lot. I hope you guys had fun as well. It seemed like it though. I hope I could provide you with all the information that you needed. Um, but I mean, there were quite, there are quite some decent solutions out there. So I think things went well. And yeah, so thanks to all participants and thanks to the organizers, of course, as this whole thing went really smoothly. Yeah, okay. big thanks. That's it from my side. First of all, thank you, Leonard, for the statement and congratulations to Magic Moisture, Moisture Magic, sorry, for winning the prize. Next one is actually your colleague, Martin. Martin, are you already with me? Perfect. I see you. Uh, yes, I am. Hey. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So, when this challenge started, a lot, quite a large number of people started to discuss in our channel and started to brainstorm with different terms and ideas and I absolutely had no clue what they are talking about. And then someone said something very nice. He said, I don't want to open any competition with this, but maybe we can exchange our findings between all the groups that work on this problem. And I think this statement is so nice and that really speaks for the collaborative team this Datatron has engaged. So we had in the end two big teams uh, the team of Neutronet and uh, team of the Heidelbeeren. <laughs> and so there was a large number of people really working together here and of small teams with small com with, with high competition. So that's what I really liked. And both team teams really created uh, great results and great presentations. All the teams used modern pre-trained models and tested multiple neural networks. Uh, chose the best network for their for their uh, solution and generated really nice tools to visualize their results and that was really very very impressive so i was totally stunned how good the results of both teams looked like they were actually able to identify landscape features in the photographs pretty well with a very high validation score and even created new creative tools for further analysis uh, for this kind of problems so Either the challenge was too simple, <laughs> or we really have state-of-the-art experts here in this round. And I believe it's the latter, especially since really good results have been achieved in this short time. So in the end, there was really no way for me to decide which of the teams delivered the best solution, since both teams had very creative approaches to the problem and should really uh, uh, and had really creative and convincing results to me. So I hereby declare both teams as winners for this challenge, 
and we'd be very happy to invite both teams to the UFZ to have further discussions on this, how to these approaches could be improved, maybe merged together. And of course, we offer involvement and cooperation with our research projects here. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the statement, Martin. And I totally agree. Um, our participants are just extraordinarily cool and good and amazing and all the, the words I can imagine now. So, and thank you uh, again and congratulations to the winning teams. Next up is Eduardo. Are, are you with me already? Yeah, I'm yeah. with you. Perfect, um, hello. I hope you can, you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Um, in our challenge, we had three groups, although one group was just um, one person. Um, they, as, I, as I warned them at the beginning of the, of the challenge, this uh, is really a very, very difficult problem. Uh, and actually, I was very pleased to see that so many showed interest in trying to face this difficult problem and try to solve it. Um, all of them actually worked uh, and, and suggested very, very interesting solutions. Um, but of course, one winner has, has to be picked. And uh, we decided after rather long discussions that the winner will be the weather people. Um, so I, I will groups just um, um, well suggested for the solution. The one person group, um, which has a complicated name, I hope I pronounce it properly, just Valentina, um, well suggested a method that was similar to well an analog method that actually we are trying to apply also to other climate problems. Um, but the well the results were not very um, positive and this I think that the interpretation for this is that the the time for the, uh, the working time was actually too short to face this difficult problem. The other group, um, ICS, um, focused on a, well, on a neural network uh, structure. Um, it was really complicated, and, uh, but very well thought. They faced the problem that in the short time to run this uh, complex model on the computer resources that we had was not really possible. So we had to, they had to restart to, to their own laptops or to a simpler uh, system. And the solution they came up uh, uh, for this prediction of the North Atlantic Oscillation was not really, well, not really impressive. But the ideas that they provided are, and uh, we are, I think we are going to, to pursue those ideas with more time in the future. And the winners, um, whether people, um, well, I, there were several things that uh, we liked uh, in this group. Actually, they provided three different solutions uh, that ranging from the very simple or more simple approach of a linear progression model, let's say, going through a random forest uh, and uh, um, f um, ending in a neural network approach. So actually, that was a nice thing that we tried to, they tried to cover well, three levels of complexity to face that problem. And it turned out that actually the more complex approach, the, the neural network, didn't work as well as the more simplest, uh, the more simpler appro approach based on, on random forest. As I, as I mentioned at the beginning, this problem was really difficult, and is really difficult, but the random forest method actually provided results that seem very interesting, really interesting. They can be optimized, I'm sure, uh, and they could really be uh, well provide a, a solution in the end uh, to this problem. So we'll be in contact with this group for those of them that uh, may be interested in working further. Uh, that will be essentially our prize uh, to try to write up a paper with, mm, with this method that I think provides a really interesting result. The neural network approaches also probably potentially uh, would, would provide a solution, but uh, at the stage of these data um, thetaton, well, they were not able really to provide a clear uh, advantage for the predictions. So that uh, was the final decision for this challenge. So congratulations to the group weather people and thank you, Eduardo, for your statement. Next up is Willy. Willy, are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Perfect. Um, as the, this, this stream probably tells you, we don't have a winner, but we had lots of fun. <laughs> uh, so we had 
probably a kind of a small group of people. In the end, it was like five people working on different aspects of the problems. Uh, none really produced the full solution, but everybody learned a lot. And I've um, basically taken the freedom to have a very, very short snapshots of what people were trying to do and where this could lead. So the first uh, people adapted the library from Uber to make any to, to bring any structure into these uh, into these millions of trajectories, and to then later treat them as geospatial spatial graphs. That was an all women team from Geomar, who already agreed on on writing a paper on this. And so they are they are not here today. They also didn't provide any any group pictures because they are still actively working on that. Then we had one of our mentors. It took some some time in. Um, some time while not mentoring and uh, who explored existing solutions from medical uh, imaging uh, for our approaches. And we had lots of input from Leonid from DAISY who um, had a look at uh, the similarities of our problem with um, particle collator. Um, he managed to bring up some proof of concept, but as the complexity of this data set is huge and the, the com computational complexity is huge as well, there doesn't seem to be any way of tackling really the 500 gigabytes of data yet. And before I give uh, the, the the stage back to Fabian, um, I want to maybe maybe briefly share a word enters perspective. We really had a, a full stress test of our support strategies for interactive users. We learned a lot, uh, but but it was also kind kind of surprising how difficult it is to to deal with like 50 people uh, that are new on a machine. Great job from uh, to to. To, uh, Samuel and Sebastian from our side, and we got lot, got lots of technical and scientific input into dealing um, with these larvae experiments that will definitely shape um, scientific work on our side in the future. And with this, thanks a lot, and I'll give back to um, Fabian. All right, thank you very much, Julie, for your statement. And yeah, sometimes it's not about finishing a project, but rather the way towards it. So. Um, and even better that you guys actually learn something from the participants, so yeah. Last but not least, we got Jing Liang as a replacement. So, are you with me? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect, hi. Uh, can you hear me? We can, yeah. Yeah, oh, great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Jing Liang, and uh, I worked uh, a lot on this uh, LCC42 uh classification today i was really really impressed by the result delivered by the participants and uh, i'm really impressed by their efficiency and their motivation think about that we only have less than two days for this very challenging task we have so much data set and they have to do literature study for the for these ideas literally I'm really impressed by all the uh, all the all the results, and I want to say all the participants they have done a great job. Congratulations to for for you all. And uh, I need to uh, announce that the winner for this LCZ LCZ classification is the team DLR LCZ forty two uncertainty team, and uh, this. Uh, Uh, get surprised is that I think <clears throat> I think the idea they have the idea of exploring the uncertainty of the deep learning model and the data set uh, is really a legi uh, legitimate uh, idea that we it's worth really worth uh, 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 further on deeper uh, deeper investigation and the study I can see a future in uh, behind this idea so that's why uh, this team uh, got surprised and congratulations to you. And, the uh, and the, in the end, I also want to thank you for to a uh, big thanks to all the organizers. Given current the situation, you guys did a great job, and it was nice experience with you all. Uh, that's all from my side. All right, thank you very much for your statement. And with that, as you mentioned, in only two days, it's amazing what you have been producing. So congratulations on winning, congratulations for taking part. Um, and please stay in touch with the challenge providers. They are eager to work with you. So please, please, please reach out to them. And with that, we almost have a wrap. Before we jump off or you jump off the stream, um, 
Remember that we will broadcast the, the videos of the winning teams just in a minute. All that's left to do now is to say some more thank yous. So first, I want to say thank you to the HIDA team. So especially to Danielle, Victoria, and Sandra. And of course, to Andreas for the great organization of the hackathon and for doing all that. So thank you very much. And I'm just looking to them. That's why I'm not looking to you guys. Also, thanks a lot to the House Ungarn, uh, our location where we are at the moment streaming from, and our technical partner, SurfU, which are back ba there. And of course, thank you to NVIDIA, Deloitte, the Umweltbundesamt, KRT, and um, Forschungszentrum Jülich for the continuous support and all the work you did, not only during the hackathon, but way before. But the biggest thank you goes out to you, dear participants. It's amazing what you did in the last two days, so thank you very much for your efforts in the data thon. Without you organizing something like that would just be yeah, useless. Just make sure to visit the HIDA website for more exciting events and news and updates. We are also on Twitter and LinkedIn and we got a newsletter. Anytime soon we will send you a survey. Please fill out that so we can improve our work with that for the event. Yeah, now we'll broadcast the winning videos. That's it. Thank you very much. See you soon. Take care and goodbye. Wow, what a nice job I have doing. I am here to present you my results. And but before, let me ask you a simple question. Uh, if you had to describe your last years in few words, how would you describe them? I will just straightforward put it now. 2020 and the whole COVID-19 situation, but I think there's a bigger challenge. There's a bigger problem, the climate change. The last year in 2019, we faced around the world in US, in, uh, in France, Germany, Russia, all around the world, we, hot, we recorded hot temperature, 50 degrees or higher. Deforestation, forest fires, and we can remember even about the Australian forest fire that happened uh, late in 2019. There is also the California weather change in 2020, and it's just dramatic. Well, if we also look at the map provided by the Southern California Energy Group that is making prediction about the climate impact, we can see basically that our planet is predicted to very heat, very high temperature by the during the next five years. You can see Africa. Europe, America, Oceania, South America, we barely hit the barrel of 65 degrees. But there's a problem because I don't want to be living in a place where the temperature is higher than 50 degrees, and I don't think you too. So here comes the, the highlighted challenge. And in this case, I focus on the Global Arrow Center, Locate Climate Zone Classification, where I have basically 17 zone based mainly on surface structure and also on surface color. There is already a model uh, provided by the DOA with the different accuracies that are written there, but our task was to create better uh, uh, efficient models. So before I continue, let me introduce myself. My name is Bernard Dutch Bussou. I'm a master's student at environmental engineering at Jacobs University. Also, I'm an NLP researcher at NASA Academy, working on neural machine formation for low resource languages. Here I have used convolutional neural network because we are primarily working with image type data. My model is made just of four uh, convolutional layers with variable activation function, four fully connected layers, and a pattern of certain activation that gives the probability of input to belong to each of those classes. In our case, we have 17 classes. I've split my data set into uh, my training data set into two parts, 80 percent for training the model and 20 for the validation to check how good the model is evaluating. My optimizer, the SUD stochastic gradient descent, I've used it because it tends to generalize way better than Adams and Adam and others optimizer. So here are my results. Uh, we have two different accuracy uh, measures here. So the overall accuracy and average accuracy. Here we can see that the overall accuracy of the D current DLL model is better than mine, my, uh, my model. But if we focus on the average accuracy, then my model performs already better than the current DLL model. And uh, the, kappa also, the kappa of value also indicates that the, the values are really good because it shows the uh, inter-rater inter reliability between samples. We can also look at the training plot and we can here 
quick ordinary see that there's no overfitting or overfitting scenario and this is really important now we also have here the computational matrix that shows how well each class has been predicted and you can see for instance that the last class 17 for instance has been well more predicted than the first one and the same thing for the the the, the, the other two so basically that was my work i thank you for your attention i thank you for I'm grateful for taking part into this contest um, and there's definitely head room to improve the model and to uh, look for better architecture. Here I've just trained for 20 epochs but I believe for more epochs for more um, data cleaning then I could reach very much more higher um, precision and accuracy. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to have a result. Hello and welcome to our presentation about using high-level open source frameworks for landscape image segmentation with PyTorch. Uh, first of all, who are we? We are Team Heidelberg, which is based on the location that we are, which is Heidelberg, and we are Patrick Scholz, Klaus Kades, and Melanie Schellenberg. Um, first of all, I would like to tell you shortly the general framework that we use and also how we work together. We use PyTorch, which offers a GPU-optimized neural network training. Uh, and in more detail, we use PyTorch Lightning, which is an extension of PyTorch um, that automatically structures the training routine. Um, and concerning the time that was given, we use the segmentation models GitHub library, which is super nice, by the way, and which uh, offers pre-trained models, um, mainly based on ImageNet. Um, and since on Datatons teamwork is really important, we can really uh, recommend uh, Visual Studio Code live sharing uh, for pair programming, which is, by the way, also a lot of fun. Um, so what was our approach? As I already said, we used the segmentation models GitHub library, uh, which is a high-level API for binary and multi-class segmentation. And the cool thing about it uh, is that it offers different model architectures as well as uh, different encoders. Um, and as I also already said, uh, it has some pre-trained uh, weights that makes uh, the training faster. Um, so how did we start? We implemented this library and then set different configurations such as uh, learning rate, architecture, uh, augmentation, and so on, and trained this uh, implementation overnight. And as you can see in this tensor board visualization, the training loss and validation loss decreases differently um, dependent on the hyperparameters that were chosen. And based on that, we chose our optimal model, and the details are listed on the right-hand side here. Um, and then trained and tested the whole network again this morning. Um, and now you're probably very keen to see the results. Uh, here are two of them. Uh, and it is quite nice because we can uh, predict different classes and also see the percentage uh, of the classes as well as the location. Um, so our outcome and outlook is uh, we are quite happy to tell you that we were able to uh, get the segmentation and also have a validation segmentation die score of roughly 95%. But still, there is a lot of a lot to improve. So, for example, there is designated post-processing for better textual output, uh, assembling multiple networks uh, would be required, additional training data, and uh, definitely further hyperparameters tuning. Um, to sum up, thanks a lot, uh, the organizers, for having that much fun and also to check out this uh, amazing data. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a team that works on a global forecast for that, uh, Alexander, Georgiana, and Silvetia. Uh, so uh, this is a problem dealing with not ranking oscillation uh, index um, would be uh, a function of temperature and pressure, and this would allow for uh, identifying the drafts in advance. Uh, the challenge was to train a model on a very small data set, only 1,000 points. We split this in 900 points for the training and 100 points for validation. Um, 
and uh, uh, we did a bit of pre-processing on data, uh, k-fold uh, the data set. Uh, the code is there, but we didn't got to use it. Uh, dimensionality reduction using UMAP, Uniform Manifold Approximation Projection, and build a small artificial neural network model um, with two inputs and uh, one regression output. Uh, these are some heat maps to explain the data. I'll quickly skip by. Uh, and um, now these are some projections on 3D. So these, uh, these tensors are quite large, 2,322 uh, points. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, arrays. Um, so this is a grid of 54 by 43. And we project them to be just to see how this looks. Uh, so it seems like quite a compact cluster. The model looks something like this. So we have the two branches for each input, one for temperature, one for pressure. Um, we split this uh, into um, a, a probability prediction to see if one is more important than the other. So this is a sigmoid uh, layer and um, a flatten uh, version of, of the previous, and then we combine it by a multiply. We intended to use some attention heads, but due to uh, issues with the infrastructure, we couldn't really run it on faster, so we had to use our own resources. Uh, metrics, regular standard um, uh, training, so uh, mean square loss and uh, mean uh, absolute error. Uh, and this is, so these are some results uh, on, uh, they're not very good, as you can see, the, the errors are very, very high. And this is a result run on, um, on dimensionality reduction. Again, it's a bit worse. So keeping that in mind, we would like to implement the missing part that we didn't have time or we couldn't run actually on, on due to issues with the clusters, run them on actually uh, powerful machines and maybe test different feature extractions. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, hope, uh, hope to work this uh, further. Welcome to the presentation of the Moisture Magic Group and our approach to the Hohesholz Soil Moisture Challenge. So um, our approach is to first transform raw data into a coherent NetCDF format, then uh, do some exploratory data analysis, and um, then do some semi-unsupervised time series classification with UMAP. First, we do some pre-processing, so we regularize the data the raw data and then resample to a fixed time interval of 15 minute steps. Uh, coordinates then are time, then the box and the level, which is the sensor ID or sensor position. We export that to a NetCDF file and you can see um, how that looks like. Um, the data looks quite wild, um, which is challenging on its own. So here you can see some examples um, that the data is on very different levels, um, has large outliers, but then also small things that are uh, flagged manually. And we want to detect those outliers. The data exploration shows um, that the automatically, so that um, data flagging with the manual flag starts 2014, and goes until 2019 um, for the soil moisture and that the okay flag is best in 2013 and then decreases. And the same um, is for the temperature where a lot more is flagged manually. Our experimental setup is the following. So we have windows of 40 minute time steps, which is 10 hours and we want to classify them as um, has an anomaly or not. Um, we use one sensor only. We don't use neighbors to classify if this sensor has an anomaly. We have soil moisture, temperature and uh, battery charge here. So our approach is a semi unsupervised um, time series classification using UMAP and um, we extract these windows and then UMAP is a dimensionality reduction tool with a quite heavy mathematical machinery that can um, somehow analyze the structure of the data in the 100, 120 dimensional space and then 
um, projected to a 2D layout similar to what a PCA could do. Um, and here you can see that in this 2D layout, the OK flag, the manual flag, and the auto flag um, have quite different densities of points, which is um, why we thought from this 2D layout, which is unsupervised, um, then uh, we could distinguish the OK flag and the manual flag. Um, and the manual flag actually looks similar to the auto flag. Um, we did this by uh, clustering by K means, and that was a supervised um, part. So that's why we call it semi-supervised. So we picked all those, we did many, many clusters, and we picked all those that had a large number of outliers in them. And you can see that the prediction and the truth are quite similar here. And um, to validate our approach, we did a receiver operating characteristic um, analysis, and you can see that the train and the test perform equally well, and you can, for example, detect 75% of all flags and um, only lose 10% of the, of the true data. So this is a clear proof of concept for us, but it's not a ready model yet because there are many things that you could still uh, tune and improve. So from a com conceptual side, you can use all the data uh, or just trustworthy data, and you can use uh, additional information like rainfall data, which is shown in that small plot here. And UMAP actually has many opportunities to optimize. You can, for example, use the neighboring sensors. Yeah, so uh, here you can see our team and that's it from us. Hi, my name is Stefan from Team Nuclear Cell. Our attempt was to improve water discovery by using segmented camera images. We are a group of nine from diverse backgrounds and we worked really hard on this challenge for the last few days. So what is this challenge about? Measuring soil moisture can be done by detecting how many nutrients are reflected from the surface. However, this is high, heavily influenced by the surface and also by objects. Um, so a forest, for example, reflects nutrients in a different way than a grass field. Originally, Identifying what kind of surface and objects I have um, in the image and the area that those uh, neutral measurements were, were made was done by hand, which is obviously extremely time consuming, tedious, and absolutely not scalable. So, our approach was to automate this. To automate this, we used the pixel wise um, semantic segmentation architecture. Our model architecture is a SegNet with a ResNet 50 backbone, it's an encoder decoder network which can be seen down here. To train our model, we optimize the die score and minimize cross entropy. In the graph, graph on the left, you can see the train, uh, the train loss. And in the graph on the right, you can see the validation die score and validation loss. So here is our confusion matrix. As you can see, we're doing pretty well on most of the labels which is some labels uh, where the predictions are a little bit off. But um, as you see, it's only 100 test images, so um, we don't have that many examples per, per class. Here you can see um, the segmentation comparison between the prediction and the ground truth and also the original image next to it. You can see that the prediction is pretty close to the actual um, to the actual ground truth in both cases. We also built a little tool which helps us to overlay the or original images with a segmentation and then also, also show you the percentage of, of what kind of objects and surfaces you have in this image. This should be really handy to um, adopt the nutrients measurements. Another thing we did is to build a small web app which allows you to upload an image and classify it on the fly. So what have we done the last few days? We visualized the data, trained and compared multiple neural networks with different architectures, and then selected the best network 
based on the dice score and use it for prediction. We also analyze the model accuracy, visualize the results, and then build an end-to-end -end pipeline for live predictions, as you could just see. We really hope that the work we have just done will help to improve the um, soil mass measurements a lot. Yeah, hello. Uh, we're Team uh, Sensor Stalker, <laughs> and um, we provide uh, one one pitch for um, the sensory experiment um, called USB Hoare's Pulse. And um, we first look at the correlation between the different uh, boxes and focused only on data from uh, 2018 to make the data more manageable. Um, also, we, we standardized the uh, time units to uh, 15 minutes each, where we uh, have uh, one observation in, in each, or at least one observation in each 15-minute uh, chunk. And we also focused on soil moisture, so we don't have a uh, solution for uh, the, the temperature sensors yet. And um, for, for soil moisture measurements, we found that there is a high correlation between the different boxes uh, over time. So uh, we figured that we could use the information uh, from other boxes and their sensors to uh, predict um, the, the values of a, a sensor in another particular box. And uh, we figured that we could use like the, the most credible neighbors, so uh, those with the uh, highest correlation with the, the current box of interest. And uh, the correlations that we see here are uh, the correlation between mean values of all sensors to um, alleviate the influence of, um, of errors. And what we found um, as well is that there, there is a strong correlation between uh, sensors that are uh, working within the same box and also between uh, boxes that are close to one another. Um, but that correlation um, starts to degenerate um, when sensors break. So uh, here in the end, you can see that the sensor two um, is damaged or is no longer working, so it was manually flagged and it doesn't correlate as well anymore uh, with the still working um, sensor six. So we figured that we could use this uh, information somehow. And the, the approach we came up with is that we first detect the most credible neighbors based on the correlation. Then uh, we um, pull all the sensor information from, from uh, these three boxes as well as the current box and detect the three sensor information with a, the w uh, with the highest correlation uh, with the sensor we're currently interested in. And the idea is um, if we find several sensors that are highly correlated with the current one, then that would be an indication that the current sensor is still working because it has to pick up something meaningful in order to uh, correlate with uh, many other sensors that are close to it. Um, yeah, so we, we uh, determined the average correlation for each chunk. And we, we did that for uh, day chunks. So for each day we get an information whether there's a high correlation with other uh, nearby sensors or not. And after that, we wanted to use cluster algorithms to differentiate between those with low and high correlation to in turn uh, differentiate between uh, those sensors that are still working and those that aren't. And what we found is that um, this average correlation information um, does offer some value. So we can differentiate between those that are um, still working well and those who presumably aren't. And we could um, make this, this approach probably more reliable um, if we use um, uh, the, the information of each individual sensor. Um, because here we just use the, the average correlation with uh, all credible near neighbors. 
Um, we also figured that we could still improve this approach by using uh, the, the uh, temporal neighbors as well, which we could not do yet. But uh, those probably also offer uh, additional information. And we could use the temperature information because we found that it's negatively correlated with, um, yeah, with um, the, the soil moisture measurement. Yeah, that is our pitch. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm here to present our work on the local climate zone classification, which was a part of the HEDA data ch challenge on the track related to earth observation, data science meets climate. Uh, we are six members that worked on this project. Uh, we have Nikos, uh, Katarina, Nabil, Christoph, and Moise as a part of our team. So the question that we wanted to ask ourselves was like how certain our models is for its classification. And to answer this question, we come up with the model uncertainty paradigm uh, that is introduced in a number of recent papers. Uh, before starting that, we have our data set, uh, the, local class, the local climate zone classification data set, uh, which has like a train data set as well as a test data set. The main part is like the number of channels for this data set. Uh, specifically, eight channels come from the Sentinel-1 satellite and the 10 channels come from the Sentinel-2 satellite. And finally, we have like the 17 different classifications of the climate zones, uh, which you can see over here in this figure as well. Now you see some of like the sample images and you can see all the different channels that we have. And each pixel has a dimension of 32 by 32. In total, we have 18 channels. Uh, we initially performed a simple component analysis uh, just to get a, like a meaningful representation of our data and to check which uh, channels contribute uh, highly distinctive features. Then comes the model uncertainty part, uh, which is also known as epistemic uncertainty. Uh, for this, we use the Monte Carlo dropout, which is a recent approach, uh, approach proposed to get uh, uncertainty estimates for our neural network. We were able to uh, do inference on the, the baseline model and our Monte Carlo dropout accuracy is around 60.4. So during testing, we also do uh, dropout as well, which isn't the case uh, when you are training neural networks generally. Over here, you can see the uncertainty estimates for one of the test samples. Uh, in this case, we picked test sample 10. And you can see like the, our classifier is certain about class eight the most, uh, although there is some confusion with class 10, uh, but like it was able to fully distinguish this class with a high confidence. And we were also able to get the variance estimates for the different classes as well. Over here, you see these distribution plots uh, for the 17 classes for this same sample that we have. And we can generate these curves from the different runs of the dropout that we ran during the prediction, during the prediction time. And we are also able to get like the, the test images, which are like the most uncertain. Or here you see like the top 10 images uh, that we got through our uh, Monte Carlo dropout runs, which were 100. And from these 100, we pick the top 10. And you can see the, the channel zero shown in this image for the top 10 
uh, uncertain images. Uncertainty was calculated based on the, the variance that we have for the samples. So yeah, these samples have the highest variance for this particular class. And our code is also available on GitHub. Uh, feel free to check out as well. Thank you for your time and attention. Hello, everyone. I was part of the team whole course, and I recognize that a lot of people followed their own approaches um, and came up with uh, very individual ideas and worked on them. So what I did, I created a Git repository where everyone can upload their stuff. And um, me, for my part, I explored some data um, and I um, worked on anomalous detection. That means um, that the SK learn package um, offers an elliptic envelope um, algorithm that filters outliers, that is dysfunctional instruments, by just a combination of unlikely um, values. So I couldn't finish this code, but what, what I could do was um, predicting um, the outliers. Um, here are the ones that are the inliners and the minus ones, these are the dysfunctional instruments. And that is my um, algorithm. Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Team Weather People. We, uh, we try to develop some forecasts for the drought. Uh, we consisted uh, of, of a team of seven people shown here. And uh, yeah, please can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So our objective actually uh, was to predict the winter North Atlantic oscillation, which is a, some kind of a dipole pattern of low pressure and high pressure in the, uh, in the North Atlantic. And what it causes actually is, uh, is, is, is a drought, drought, uh, is drought seasons in the Mediterranean during, uh, during negative and positive uh, NAO patterns, uh, we have we have them uh, dry, uh, yeah, dry, a uh, dry, uh, draw, uh, no droughts in the Mediterranean. Okay. Can you go on, please? Yeah. So what we had as as a data was uh, was a synthetic data from a complex earth system model from the IPCC with 900 years of training data and 100 years of of test data. And the target was to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to model the, uh, the average NAO index in the winter. And we had uh, surface air, sea tem uh, air temperature and sea level pressure at the surface. And the NAO index is shown here on the right panel with, uh, as an anomaly with zero mean. And we have here uh, an NAO index between three and minus three. Yeah, first of all, we did some data exploration where we found that uh, sea level pressure is, has some correlation to NAO, which is shown in the left panel, and most representative is that at 40 to 50 degrees north. So after first looking at the data, um, we need to prepare because the data is very noisy that we got here. Um, so first we need to define our target variable. We chose a binary classification and also tried multiple classes. Um, which was hard, especially for the algorithms, um, because it is easy to just predict like the most common class. Um, we stuck to binary classification based on the sign of the NAO, so positive, negative. And secondly, we did some dimensionality reduction um, based uh, on PCA. So we um, reduced the features to the 50 most uh, important principal components. Um, then we defined um, three methods. Um, we tried out more methods. The first approach is a linear regression approach, um, which is kind of a baseline for us. So we have continuous target, and in the end, we look at the positive and negative signs, um, which was a little bit better than random guessing, but not that much. So uh, on cross validation, chain fold cross validation, we got a 51% accuracy. Two other more machine learning based approaches are first, the random forest, and second, the CNN. With the random forest, we also take the 50. Uh, strongest PCAs as an input, and we actually get more promising results on the test set, so 61%.
which is already not bad given that we have very noisy data and not that much data, so only 800 observations. The third approach is CNN is a bit more sophisticated, um, so we reshaped the data to a grid to have some spatial dimensions. Unfortunately, it didn't work that well. Um, not, a, not a good test accuracy, um, but I think that there's more potential in that direction. Um, so to quickly conclude, um, we did not get that much better results for most of the methods, which um, is because the data is quite noisy, um, and I think it needs uh, additional preparation, and further ideas would be to incorporate some domain knowledge or use some ensemble methods. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, 
in the data when uh, uh, and uh, there is uh, also more blue uh, it's like it's, it's a mix of uh, multiple colors in the data uh, and uh, basically if you go to the temperature matrix also and uh, here uh, there is not like the previous one here it is quite different and uh, you don't see much of a uh, different scenario uh, compared to the previous one so, so what I, I would like to say is that uh, because uh, basically we follow uh, atmospheric mass when we are uh, uh, when we are uh, understanding the ocean temperature the uh, so that is how my idea is to understand this data in a more general, more domain perspective to get a thought of it about it. if there is any kind of uh, any kind of differences that uh, that when we are finding the, the uh, analysis in your network or when we are running the machine learning model, the machine learning model must be, can be able to differentiate between these. Uh, uh, these differences. So let's get into the base models. Basically, I try to apply base models itself and uh, not tell you too much into the advanced model. So, first thing is a multi layer spectrum model, spectrum uh, model, which one layer and one base layer. And uh, gradient boosting is the same, uh, working with the pair with gradient boosting, random forest in the linear direction. And stacking grid in a pair with uh, support vector machine and region lasso, lasso region. So we see here the comparison, we see it's a strange uh, phenomenon where most of the regressors are performing worse, very worse uh, than a linear horizontal, horizontal line. So it is, uh, I think, uh, the predictability. Uh, of the probability, predictability, probability, predictive scores are very less, or uh, uh, there is no real relation between the output variables and the output variables when we are dealing with this kind of thing. And uh, in order to understand a little bit deeper, I try to delve into the output clause, what is happening with that. Uh, with the predictions of the effect data and the validation of data itself. So here you see here, uh, uh, the first one is an MLT regressor, gradient boosting and using regressor and stacking regressor. As you see in the stacking regressor, we use the uh, SDR region also basically a linear, uh, linear regressor. So we see that, uh, you see here pattern of predictions where we are, are predicting the linear. But when we come across this ML2 regressor, it's a little bit random in the sense, uh, but it is not performing, uh, it is quite random in the sense that uh, uh, it is performing worse than a linear regressor. So uh, this new clause will give an idea that uh, how our test predictions are working out. And uh, basically to conclude, uh, I would say that uh, the, I also implemented a, a few, uh, few uh, um, uh, TMCNN, which is uh, which is a two uh, two frame uh, CNN. Where I use one CNN for uh, sea level surface uh, pressure and uh, another CNN for surface. Uh, but uh, it is also performing what when we do it and uh, it is unable to the accuracy is absolutely zero in the sense that it is very uh, very sticking or it is kind of it is not able to uh, actually detect uh, any pattern in these both of these variables and uh, comparing to i would say that the next step uh, steps in this uh, research will be uh, implementing the image based GNN on the heat map. Uh, the heat map that we have created, creating images of those heat, uh, images of those uh, heat maps, uh, images from those heat maps, and, uh, and uh, feeding to CNN would be much better idea, I would say, than uh, using base estimators as a, as a 
as a metric uh, to evaluate these theorems. And uh, the complexity in this problem, there are only two variables uh, to detect. And, uh, uh, and uh, getting features out of these two variables is pretty hard in the sense that you cannot be able to produce more features that are needed to actually uh, do any relationship between the input and output variables. So that is what uh, I would like to say, and uh, that is what uh, uh, I did over this uh, over this one night. Uh, and thank you, Liam. Thank you, Vida, uh, for uh, conducting uh, this uh, uh, connecting this uh, data pond. And uh, I would like to see more and more events coming up from uh, from Vida. And uh, I'm very much interested to participate in this. And uh, thank you, thank you, Liam.